Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I was interested listening to, to Jackie Bailey's speech, and she tried to conjure the image of a, a mystery thriller. And unfortunately, during the course of her speech, the only image I could come up with was of Jackie Bailey standing outside a room with a cup pressed against the door, trying to listen in to what was happening behind that particular door. I think that uh, the, there is a balance to be struck, and I think the point was made by the convener, um, that what we don't want to have a situation of is essentially the Scottish Government outlining its negotiating position in full in public. Um, and I think one of the difficulties I have is that and I listened very carefully during Jackie Bailey's speech, I didn't hear any detail of the kind of things Jackie Bailey wants to see the Scottish Government laying before Parliament. Now, I appreciate she said that she only had a set amount of time, but I suspect she could have at least given us a flavour of the kind of things that she would like to see the Scottish Government laying before Parliament for scrutiny as part of this process that might have perhaps been uh, you know, given an indication of what, the, the deputy, what she was expecting from the Deputy First Minister. I think the, the questions around the fiscal framework for me sort of come down to issues around flexibility, fairness and transparency. Flexibility in so far as if we are to have new powers devolved to us, we must have the ability to then use those powers for the betterment of the people of Scotland. And the fiscal framework will determine the flexibility that the Scottish Government has to use the financial powers available to it uh, in order to deliver on that. And, and that's why the, the, the issue around um, the command paper and the co subsequent comments by the Secretary of State for Scotland and the fact that those two do not sit well together, as I've said previously, um, needs to be bottomed out because the command paper at 2.2.5 is very clear. In the context of Scottish devolution, the fiscal framework must ensure that Scotland contributes proportionally to the overall fiscal consolidation pursued by the UK Government, essentially tied to the austerity agenda. But at the Devolution and Further Powers Committee, the Secretary of State was explicit that the intention of the fiscal framework was not to restrict the flexibility of the Scottish Government. So we have two different positions being articulated by the UK Government, and it's important that those two positions are explored forensically to determine what exactly will be the position uh, in relation to the, the fiscal framework and the ability of the Scottish Government to operate within that and to use the powers that are being granted to it. And that is equally true when it comes to the issue around borrowing powers, which, as has been highlighted, are not explicitly mentioned within the Scotland Bill, but we know that borrowing powers uh, are to come to the Parliament. And there's a question around what, what the role of those borrowing powers will be. Will they be supplementary to the current Capital Dell budget, or will they be in place of the Capital Dell budget? And that's uh, a, a not immaterial consideration, because if they are to replace capital Dell, then we get into a situation where we face a revenue hit simply to stand still in terms of capital expenditure in this parliament and to go beyond a standstill situation would incur further revenue hit. So that's a material consideration as to how fair uh, and flexible the, the fiscal framework will be. The issue around independent arbitration, I think, is important. And uh, Gavin Brown says that he, he doesn't agree uh, that there needs to be independent arbitration. And I think that the, the weight of evidence that came before the committee uh, would indicate that having a situation where the, the Treasury is sole arbiter, I think was the, the, the term that we used in the report, or judge and jury uh, on these matters, I think uh, it, it doesn't lead to uh, an image of fairness uh, 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 in terms of the way that the fiscal framework will be dealt with because if the Treasury uh, has both an interest in the outcome and also is the ultimate decision maker in that outcome, it doesn't take too much of a leap of logic to suggest that it will serve its own interests rather than necessarily reflecting uh, on the balance of interests and coming to a, 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 a conclusion on the basis of that. So an independent arbiter, I think, would be important uh, in terms of ensuring that the Treasury essentially uh, plays fair in this process and doesn't simply look after its own interests to the detriment of the abilities of this Parliament to exercise the powers that are being devolved to it. And also, uh, in terms of fairness, I think the, the committee um, and, and on both this committee and the Devolution and Further Powers Committee, uh, I've spent a long time trying to come to terms with what exactly the second no detriment principle is going to mean in practice. I think that we're still a long way from getting to that point. I think the point about a high level principle is fair enough. 
But I think the difficulty we have is uh, in, in what circumstances would it apply and at what element of future proofing will there be around this so that, for example, an outcome five years hence is not traced back to a decision that was taken and a, a, a call for compensation under no detriment is applied. There has to be some in, uh, indication of how, for what period of time, a no detriment principle applies when the second no detriment principle is, is being uh, examined. And, and finally, uh, presenting officer, around the issue of transparency. Um, <clears throat> the Devolution and Further Powers Committee has done a, 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 an amount of work on intergovernmental relations and has published a report around intergovernmental relations. And one of the recommendations that the committee has come up with is that intergovernmental relations and the scrutiny of intergovernmental relations should become a responsibility of a committee of this parliament to examine and explore. Uh, and has also said that there should be some uh, examination both before and after uh, meetings uh, of uh, formal meetings uh, of the two governments. The, the question that I would have and the, the issue that I would have is that I think it's fair enough for us to do that in this parliament and to take those steps in this parliament. My question would be what is happening at the other end of the process and how do we ensure that appropriate scrutiny uh, is being applied at the Westminster end of the process in terms of intergovernmental relations because uh, if our ministers are coming to our committees and talking about both the discussions they're going to be having and the outcome of those discussions there has to be also a scrutiny applied to the role of Westminster uh, governments in that respect as well um, and while we on uh, in this parliament cannot compel Westminster uh, well cannot compel Treasury ministers or any Westminster government minister to attend a committee meeting in this parliament. That power does exist for Westminster Parliament committees and it may be worth them exploring certainly how they would take that forward uh, in terms of the scrutiny of intergovernmental relations. So I think the, the work that the committee has done, and I pay tribute to the clerks for the, the work they've done in uh, supporting the work of the committee on this, I think the work this committee has done has outlined the areas that really need to be probed around the fiscal framework. And I think that one of the things that the, the Scottish Government is focused on, and I think we should support them in this, is ensuring that flexibility, fairness and transparency are at the heart of the fiscal framework that we will hopefully see uh, presented to Parliament uh, once the uh, negotiations have concluded.